Hello and welcome fellow time travellers, it's great to have you with me as we journey through a million years of history together, get us. Uh, this week we're in Wiltshire, uh, around four and a half thousand years ago, walking beneath the great trilithons of Stonehenge, one of the uncontested wonders of the world. But before we get started, I just want to say a huge thanks to everyone who signed up to my Patreon site. Your support helps make this podcast possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you. If you're not a member yet and you want to join, simply go to patreon.com and search for me by name. That's Neil Oliver. And you will get, in return, thought-provoking videos every week, uh, exclusive to Patreon. Okay, now it's time for the next episode of my love letter to the British Isles. So strap yourself into the time machine and cue the music. People felt the need to express the insides of their heads. They had ideas going on that demanded massive expression. This week's podcast travels to one of the world's most famous monuments. Huge stones weighing up to 40 tonnes each. Great sarsen trilithons place that speaks of massive intent, tracking the light, the planets and time. After 5,000 years, it still has the power to put us all in our place. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver, and this is my love letter to the British Isles. In the last podcast, we walked with the spirits of our ancestors when you took us to Wiltshire in the incredible West Kennet Long Barrow. Where are we now? We're staying in Wiltshire, exploring one of the historical wonders of the world, a place that's still revealing its secrets 5,000 years after work on it first began. It's Stonehenge. Like most people, I think the first approach to Stonehenge is almost guaranteed to be something other than you would have expected. Everyone approaches it via the A303 and Invariably, you approach it from a distance, and when you first see it, the stones are small. And most people, myself included, first sight, you say, oh, it's so much smaller than I was expecting. But then, you park the car, and by whatever route you take, you, you finally approach the stones. And if you get the opportunity to get close to the stones, if you get up close, oh, say, close enough to touch them, they become overwhelming. They have an overwhelming power. Even after 5,000 years, they exert a powerful force on the human imagination. So you go from, it's a strange experience. I first went to see Stonehenge uh, when I was a, a, a second year archeology span student. We went on a field trip, and it was second year or third year, I can't remember now, and we went in a bus, you know, one of those typical university field trip experiences. Uh, and I remember approaching it and seeing them, catching a first glimpse of them and being shocked by how they seemed small. Because Stonehenge, it's, it's, like, the, it's like the Great Pyramids in Egypt or something, they're so familiar. Or, or it's like Times Square in New York, or it's like the Empire State Building. You, you've seen them a thousand times in books or on television. And when you're confronted with the reality, there's no getting away from the fact that they appear small. It's just shocking. You could hold it in the palm of your hand. You think, that can't be right. It looks like you could shake it in a snow globe and snow would fall down beside it. It doesn't look, doesn't look right. But somehow that enhances the experience of when you actually do get the opportunity to get up close, 
then they suddenly become what they are, and they are huge. Uh, you, uh, the main uh, Stonehenge is made of many parts, and it was it was constructed over centuries, and people had different ideas at different times. But the bit that's most famous are the are the great Sarsen uh, trilithons, two uprights with a top, uh, and there are many of those at Stonehenge. And once upon a time, it was a complete circle with three very large trilithons in the middle, towering over everything. And the big stones, each individual big stone that makes up the trilithon, it weighs maybe 40 tonnes. Now, an adult African elephant maybe weighs five tonnes. These are big stones. Uh, And the fact that so many of them were put upright and erected and set into sockets so that they would stay upright... It speaks of massive intent on the part of the people that did it. I mean, this is every bit as ambitious as people building pyramids. It's that level of ambition to set yourself to to creating these structures. So although your first approach, you suddenly see this in the distance and it looks like a a toy, looks like a toy of Stonehenge. (laughs) And then 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 you get the opportunity, if you get the opportunity to get up close to them, and you see them for what they are, which is something that even after 5,000 years has the power to put you in your place and make you feel small. So having dwarfed Stonehenge on the approach, you are in turn dwarfed by it, which is possibly, probably, the original intention of the people that designed and built that phase of Stonehenge. When did work start on building Stonehenge? let's say about 3,100, 3,000 years BC, a group of farmers, uh, a farming community, decided to create something on, a, on a, an expanse of chalky ground that maybe previously been surrounded by, by their fields. At, at some point, archaeologists have shown that there were, there were posts, timber posts had been set in place maybe long before the farmers came and these had rotted and fallen down but there may have been something that that was known to be in that location that the farmers were aware of and decided to augment and the first thing that the farmers did was uh, to dig a big circle a big circular ditch about three or four hundred feet across in diameter And they were digging into chalky ground, so the rubble that they were digging out... Now imagine, remember, they're digging with uh, tools of stone and wood and and red deer antler. You know, they don't have metal. So they're digging through rock, chalky rock, but rock nonetheless, with with stone and antler. And they pile up the, the rubble on the outside of the ditch. So it's a bank, so there's now a ditch with a bank around the outside. So the first thing that was at Stonehenge... 5,000 years ago, 3,000 years BC, would have looked like a big white polymen lying on the grass. A big, a big white bank that would have been visible from far away. So it's, circle, it's circles again? It's always a big circle. The shape that seems to have preoccupied people to begin with was the circle. And, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. You know, when you look up in the sky, the moon, the moon is a circle. The sun, if you can bear to look at it for a split second, is a circle. Lots of things make circular shapes. You know, a wave as it's forming and, and then breaking is a circle. A fern that's growing, it, it, it uncurls as a circle that gets bigger. Uh, when, a, when a blade of grass vibrates in the, in the sand at the beach, it makes a circular shape around it. So circles happen. They're a natural formation. And... And also the farmers were aware of a a cycle of seasons, a circle of spring, summer, autumn and winter. A repeating pattern, which may have suggested in their imagination another kind of circle. Invisible, but still a circle. The circle of life, as Elton John sings about in The Lion King. (laughs) Circle has preoccupied human beings for a very, very long time. So the first thing that they built at Stonehenge was a circle, as it so often was. So they, they, they dig a ditch, they pile up the white chalk around the outside of the ditch. So you've got a big sur- big polament. And then at some point after that, uh, they dug uh, s- holes in the ground, sockets, and they put stones into, into, the, into the sockets. 
or, or, or they may have. It's, it's difficult to know because what archaeologists have found are these empty pits, these empty holes around it. Sometime in the middle of the second millennium BC, so let's say, for the sake of argument, let's say 1,700 years BC. I mean, there's not much... You don't get a lot of information really from knowing the precise dates of these things. It's just a it's just a long drawn out story really, drawn out across generations and centuries of people thinking. And so, but, but around that time, let's say the middle of the of the second millennium BC, some bunch of farmers were in contact with people in the Preseli Hills in Pembrokeshire, in South Wales, and we know that because they imported to Stonehenge. Uh, 200 tonnes of stone from the Preseli Hills. Lumps weighing about a tonne each. And they set these Preseli stones, as they're called, into two circles, one inside the other. So they put a circle of Preseli stones and then inside that they put another circle. Okay, so it circles again. So inside the ditch and bank, you've now got two circles made of these Preselli stones. They're called blue stones because with a certain amount of imagination and maybe if the light's right, they're wet, they have a kind of a bluish tinge to them. They're not especially blue, but they're, they're always known as the Preselli blue stones. But they've come from a long way then. Yeah, oh yes. Yes, they had they had come, like, well, you're talking 150 miles. And the speculation, well, lots of people have speculated how that might have been achieved and probably the easiest way to do it would have been to drag them to the sea in Pembrokeshire, put them on boats and then f- float them round to some point on the coastline nearest to Stonehenge and then drag them and somehow manoeuvre them to, to, to where they are in Stonehenge. So these two circles were set up. And then later, those, so those circles were in place for a long time, generations, and then another group of farmers uh, decided to move those stones out of the way. So they, so they moved away those blue stones And they erected instead the big circle of sarsen uprights, monoliths as they're called, single stones, a big circle of them, and on top of them, lintels. So like like the top of a doorway. So they they created a circle of stones with a a, a circular lintel right around the top. And, And fascinatingly, they used carpentry techniques. They were working in stone, but they made uh, like mortise and tenon joints. So they carved, the, they, they knocked sockets into the top of the upright stones, holes drilled down, knocked, chipped out. And on the underside of, the, of each lintel, there were two knobs sticking out that clunked into position on top. Again, working in stone, using stone to shape stone, very laborious. And more to the point, they didn't really need to do it because they, they're just the weight of the stones would have held them in place. They're not going to get blown off by the wind. Just the weight of the stones would have held them, but they were determined to use the sort of techniques that carpenters would use if they were working in timber. And some some more imaginative people really have even suggested that the surface of of some of the uprights might have been worked and carved to suggest wood, as if there was an intention on the part of the of the designers of that part of Stonehenge to respect something else that had been made of wood and of which now there is no trace. And, you know, we've, we've speculated before, it may have been out of a memory of the first place of significance clearing in Woodland, which at certain times people had been in the habit of gathering inside for meetings, ceremonies, maybe to light fires, tell stories, who knows what. And then as time went on and there were fewer and fewer trees because the farmers were cutting them down, it became the, the open space that it is now. And, and the, some of the architects of different phases of Stonehenge at different times might have been harking back to a time when, the, when what was there was a circle in the woods, a clearing in the woods. So in any event, they built this big circle of stones with lintels all the way around, and then inside it were built the iconic trilithons. It means three stones, two uprights and a massive lintel on top. And again, they're, they're done with these unnecessary, laborious carpentry techniques. 
and there's all sorts of stuff going on. There's three trilithons and there's two, and then there's one bigger one, the biggest of them all, in the middle. And the entrance to the circle, the biggest trilithon, and a great big boulder outside the circle called the heel stone are all in a line. So they've, they've carefully made the entrance and then the then they built the trilithon to respect that and then it's on the same line as the heel stone and that line marks the the trajectory of the sun in the sky in midsummer and midwinter so it, when they were building it when they were getting ready to build this, this, this the circles and the trilithons they paid attention to to where the sun would set and rise on midwinter's day so there's, there's kind of a, an astronomical consideration, which again underscores the fact that the farmers were preoccupied with the seasons. As farmers are, to this day, they're always looking up. Farmers are always looking at, you know, what's, what's the weather doing? It's a farming preoccupation. And so these, these farmers, you know, four and 5,000 years ago were similarly, were similarly preoccupied with the seasons. And people have, will be speculating about what Stonehenge was for. You know, we always have. People have been fascinated by it for centuries. What's going on here? And it seems that Stonehenge might have been of particular significance in midwinter. I mean, obviously now, you know, hippie types go to Stonehenge and have a big party in midsummer. I've been there at midsummer and it's mobbed with people. But it seems that, that Stonehenge when it was a functioning ritual place may have been more important in midwinter, funnily enough. And we know that because there's uh, there's a, a, a settlement, a Neolithic settlement nearby called Durrington Walls, uh, which is not far away. It's a, it's a walking distance away from Stonehenge. And archaeologists have excavated at Durrington Walls and they've established that people were gathering large herds of pigs there bringing in pigs in large numbers. And they can tell from looking at the, the jaw bones and other bones on the animals, they can tell when they were slaughtered. And the, it, they're pigs that were being slaughtered in the autumn, at the end of the year, when the nights are long and the nights are long and dark. And it looks as though people were in the habit of coming to Durrington Walls and to Stonehenge in the middle of winter, gathering together in large numbers, slaughtering pigs, consuming pigs, having big barbecues. And it, they may have been coming to Stonehenge to do something with the remains of their dead. N not the dead pigs, but their dead loved ones. That, you know, they may have, when someone died during the year, they may have uh, kept the body or they may have cremated the body and just kept some of the cremated bones. And then they were bringing that to Stonehenge in midwinter and maybe burying some of the bones in the ground or the archaeologists have found cremated human remains around Stonehenge. And it, and it seems as though people may have been probably going to Stonehenge at all times of the year and for all sorts of different reasons. But it looks as if there might have been an important annual ceremony to come in midwinter, to gather together in large numbers and to celebrate or remember the dead, the people who had died during the course of the year. For people, for farmers who have who have thought about it and have watched this the cycle of seasons, the year seems to die every winter. You get spring, which is like a time of birth for the lambs and the calves, and then there's the summer, and then there's the harvest in autumn, and then the sun goes away. So for these people who were so preoccupied with the seasons, if you think of the year being born in the spring, and then then there's and all the animals are born, lambing and the calving, and then the crops ripen, there's high summer, and then there's the harvest, and then the year seems to die. The sun doesn't come into the sky much, and the days are shorter, and the nights are longer, and it's cold, the, the, the warmth isn't there. And so it's a time of death. And people may have thought, well, maybe we should acknowledge our dead at the same time. So you, you, you celebrate the dead 
at that time at Stonehenge, in the sure and certain knowledge that from midwinter's day and night onwards, the warmth starts to come back incrementally. Every day the day gets a little bit longer and then the night gets a little bit shorter, but it's like the start of something. It's like the year being kindled, a tiny spark, you know, there's this tiny hint of warmth again from that point onwards. So Stonehenge is, is yet another of these uh, reminders of, of how the early farmers were, were so fixated upon the landscape and upon the turn of the seasons. And they were folding their own experience of life and birth and death into the circle of seasons so that all of it became one picture that made sense. The building tracked the light. Yes, they're, they're making sure that the that day and that night in the, in the depths of winter, you know, that's the, that's the day when the sun sets over the entrance to Stonehenge. And then the next day you've got the sun rising on that line so that the, the sun is, is coming across the circle in a very precise and memorable way. And it'd be the same every year. You know, they would be reassured every year that the sun was in the same place again. Would it have been famous at the time? It certainly seems reasonable to imagine. I'm always fascinated by it must have had a name, but we call it Stonehenge. Stone, Stonehenge actually means something like the hanging stones. And it's a reference to the way that the lintels are up and hanging on the, on the upright stones, the hanging stones. But there would surely have been a name for that place in the, in the time of the farmers who, who built it and for centuries thereafter. And it's certainly reasonable to imagine that people were drawn to it like, as though to a kind of a Neolithic Lourdes. So you've got these places in the landscape by this point. You've got the Ness of Brodgar, which is that special site on Orkney, that, that enclosure made of two stone walls across a narrow finger of land. And within that space, the farmers were building and building and building. And that would have had a name that would have been known far and wide and people may well have sought it out on pilgrimages. And, and likewise, Stonehenge, nearby Avebury. These would have been places that were known, not just to the people in their immediate vicinity, but, but word of their significance would surely have spread. And people would come. You know, as they say, if you build it, he will come. People would have been drawn. Because that's, that would have been a world in which there weren't many buildings. People would have been living in, in settlements, there would have been farming villages like Scarabray on Orkney and, and Durrington, places where people had homes and, and houses and structures, but it, it wasn't a landscape like we know it. And so some, something so massive as Stonehenge would have been very conspicuous. Imagine encountering it if you, if you come from a, of a, from a world of modest timber buildings, turf, thatch, wooden, and you can go to somewhere where there's a, a circle three or four hundred feet in diameter with a circle of stones, weighing, each one weighing tens of tons, it'd be like going to visit the pyramids, to suddenly be confronted with what it is that men and women are capable of constructing when they work together. You'd have been knocked out of your socks by Stonehenge, because there simply wouldn't have been many places or possibly any place else like it. It might have been unique. In many respects, it's amazing it survived. Yes, it is, because there have been periods in the not-too-distant past when, when those places were associated in the minds of Christians uh, with, with pagan behaviour. All sorts of folklore and myths were kicked up to explain long after people had known what, what Stonehenge was really for or any of the stone circles were for, there were stories. And, and quite often, depending on where you are in the landscape, people will tell you that the circle of stones there is a, uh, it's giants that were turned to stone. Or it's where, um, it's where uh, witches were turned to stone for their, for their pagan behaviour. There's all sorts of folklore and myth around these places. And, and on account of that, many places, many of these uh, circles may have been deliberately destroyed 
you know, there would have been attempts to get rid of them because at, at different times they might have been associated with badness, evil, mischief, pagan, heathen behaviour. But to some extent, it may have been just the sheer mass of Stonehenge. Uh, it's, it's big, it's a lot of hard work to get rid of it. Uh, so it, it, the sheer scale of it may to some extent have, have protected it for all those thousands of years. But th- there was also, the, the, at the same time as people uh, thinking it, associating it with pagan r- ritual, they might have been a little bit scared of it at the same time. You know, people might have been superstitious about it and possibly just avoided it and, and held it at, at arm's length. Uh, but it's it's rightly famous around the world Stonehenge is one of those locations, 5,000 years old or not, that people have heard of it all over the world. In the same pe- way that people have heard of the Sphinx, or Machu Picchu, or the Great Pyramid, or the Colossus of Rhodes, or the Artemisium, people have heard of Stonehenge. You know, it's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It's in the pantheon of unforgettable places on planet Earth, and it's here in the British Isles. What's the countryside Stonehenge sits in like? It's a distinctive landscape. You know, that part of Wiltshire has an atmosphere and a look all of its own, which is a product of the fact that, you know, there's a lot of it is chalk and that has a particular geomorphology. So it's a, a, a gentle rolling landscape. And, and of course, you know, as we've mentioned before, that part of Wiltshire is, is studied with places of significance. West Kennet Longbarrow, Avebury, Silbury Hill. You know, there's a whole there's a whole world of Neolithic imagination expressed in that landscape, and and Stonehenge is a is a precious jewel. But you know, it's in a it's in a complicated setting. You know, it's it's, it's surrounded all about, and, and the people that paid attention to Stonehenge at the time would have been aware of and would have paid attention to the other sites as well because they would have been in action in one phase or another, overlapping one another. So archaeologists talk about ritual landscapes. So as well as being places where people lived and worked, their fields, their crops, their homes, their ordinary daily life, it was all, all of that was going on uh, within, a, within a ritual landscape that they had created of these special places where at different times of the year they would gather for the things that bring people together. We, in our modern, in our 21st century world, our consciousness, we still gather for christenings, for funerals, for weddings. Uh, you know, in the aftermath of a, of, a, of a war, you know, people want to come together and, and share the memory of it and to talk about it. You know, even now people want to all gather together at the same time and do the same thing. Let's all gather at eight o'clock and clap. Well, you know, as it turns out, thousands of years ago, people wanted somewhere to go to all gather together in a ceremony that made, that that helped them to make sense of something big that had just happened. People might have worried to some extent that that the winter might never end. You know, you go into a particularly bad winter, Uh, You know, there's that anxiety. Will we live? Will the food supplies last? You know, you would make what you could of the of the sup of the autumn harvest. You'd preserve stuff. You'd smoke meat. You'd dry meat. You'd you'd lay down supplies to get you through it. You know, in the same way that people have sort of laid down supplies to get through the coronavirus. Well, people every year they would have to think, how bad's the winter going to be if it starts earlier than usual and lasts longer. Will we get to the other side? Will we ever see spring again? And so there would have been a life or death importance to knowing that you'd reached midwinter. You'd go over the hump. You know, however bad it's been from this day and night onwards, the days will get a little bit longer and the nights will get a little bit shorter. You know, these were people who were entirely dependent upon the sweat of their own brows, the strength of their own backs. If they didn't grow their own food, and grow enough of it, they would die. And so knowing that winter was coming to an end would have been the kind of thing that would make every generation, every year, people would 
big sigh of relief. We might make it. We might make it to spring. You know, in places like Stonehenge, because they are, because they pay attention to the sun and the moon and astronomical stories that are being told in the sky, we know that these people were watching time. They were aware of the passing of time every year. And so a place like Stonehenge is a kind of a timepiece. It doesn't have moving parts like a clock, but, but the universe moves around it. And it's, it's ticking and counting the hours in the kind of polar opposite of a clock. You know, it stands still and the universe moves. You know, it, but it's a, way of, it's a way of watching time pass and being reassured by the idea that time is passing and you're getting through the darkest part of the year. And, and you know, we've, we've talked as well about how the, the hunters possibly felt they belonged to the landscape, they were part of it, and they were brother and sister to the animals. But the far, for the farmers, it was different. They felt that they owned a patch of landscape. You know, they, they had that sense of uh, ownership. And that's, a, that's a, a different mindset. It's a profoundly different way of thinking. And they had become, you know, a certain small way, the centre of the universe. If you're fixed in one place, if you're in your village, surrounded by your fields, and you look up in the sky every night, you see it moving. And so that's we know that we know that we go around the sun, and that our galaxy is going around the outer rim of the universe. You know we've got that modern understanding, but all the physical evidence for them probably suggested that the universe was moving around their field. <laughs> And it was moving around Stonehenge. That Stonehenge was a fixed point, and the, and the, and the, the constellations and the sun and the moon moved around it. So the farmers, for the farmers, might have been the first people to think we are the center of the universe, and the universe is revolving around us, and this is the fixed point around which that great spectacle in the sky is revolving. By today's standards, this was a major build. How was it paid for? Well, in terms of, say, the stones that were coming from 150 miles away in, in Pembrokeshire, Priscelli, uh, there must, let's imagine there was some sort of exchange that the people that brought the, the stones from Priscelli, they might have taken something else away. In terms of the build, it's all about um, human power, human strength. You know, some of the biggest stones at Stonehenge, as we said earlier, are 40 tonnes. And, and they had to be moved by wedges and ramps of earth and simple, simple technology, but nonetheless involving a lot of people working together in concert with a shared objective. So that in itself, you know, you're talking about where people are organised enough that they will come together, maybe under one leader, one person whose vision it is who has worked out how it's going to be done and, and has people around him or her that will do his or her bidding. To realise this, you're, you're talking about hundreds of hours of effort per stone, you, you know, to get them into position. And it was an ongoing process. You know, the Stonehenge kept on changing. And in, it's interesting as well, we, um, we think in terms of building something and getting it finished so that we can use it as quickly as possible. You build an office block or a bridge across a river or a motorway. It, it's done as fast as possible so you can use it. But there seems to have been a long period during the Neolithic where it was, it was the act of making that mattered. You know, so it, because Stonehenge was never finished, but when eventually people walked away from Stonehenge, stopped using it, it wasn't finished. You know, the, the, the big circle of, of upright stones with lintels on the top, it doesn't look as if it was ever finished. But that's our perspective. We want things finished. But it might have been the case that these people were coming together because it was the act of coming together and cooperating that mattered. Because apart from anything else, it meant that a lot of people were in one place at one time, which is very useful for people that live scattered, isolated lives. 
you need to know that there are certain places at certain times of the year where you'll be able to go and find other people. People need people. And so a, a massive building project that never ends from year to year, generation to generation, right, we've had those circles, let's move that out of the way, let's build something else, right, let's knock that down, let's move, let's change. They're not working towards a finished picture. It's just coming together and working. And you have to get your head around that. You know, they, they didn't, no one at any point said, that is Stonehenge. It was never finished. Because it doesn't look as though that was what mattered. What mattered was to bring people together, have them cooperate on something massive that they all understood. That was enough. It touches you though, doesn't it? All of these places do. I'm, I'm just particularly affected by the fact that people so long ago, a time before pyramids, a time beyond all the history we think about, really, the, the people felt the need to express the insides of their heads. They had ideas going on that demanded massive expression. In relation to the number of people who were available and the technology that they had to hand, Stonehenge is, is a great pyramid. It is a skyscraper. It was as much as those people could dream of doing. And to know that 5,000 years ago people were setting their backs to that kind of exercise. I mean, it didn't feed them. They couldn't live off it. It wasn't doing anything practical for them. And yet they were prepared to expend thousands of hours of back-breaking effort to create it, you think? If only we knew what the motivation had been. Circles within circles, and circles in time. At its heart, weighing nearly 100 tonnes, is a keystone called the Cove, a prehistoric marvel that's massive in scale, dug from chalk with antler picks and muscle, the largest stone circle in the British Isles. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles, to ensure you get each new episode of this podcast as it goes live, don't forget to subscribe, write a review and share with your friends. You can follow in my footsteps as my journey unfolds across these aisles of ours by going to my podcast's Instagram account, Neil Oliver Love Letter, and seeing the places I've chosen. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book, it's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Neil Oliver and Paul Ratcliffe for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. The additional research was by Oscar, Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. The finance was by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios. Graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production. <laughs> <laughs>